Um, my outline is three E's, okay? It is execution, escape, and ready for this one? Eaten by worms, okay? <laughs> Eaten by worms, okay? So the, the execution of James, uh, the escape of Peter, and eaten by worms for Herod Agrippa. Um, my first point this morning is one of the greatest challenges to overcome is trying to make sense when darkness wins. And Acts 12, 1 to 4, uh, it says these words. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread around the Passover time. That, so when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers, about 16 soldiers around Peter at this time, to keep him, to guard him, intending to bring him before the people after the Passover, which was to court and then to publicly execute uh, Peter. And th this chapter really is about God and Herod. It is, uh, it's about the exaltation of Herod and the attempt to limit the church and limitation and the elimination of Christians. This chapter is about a power struggle. And here we have James, who is the uh, first of the apostles to be martyred. That all 11 of the 12 would eventually be martyred, uh, with the exception of John, the beloved apostle, who was James's uh, brother. And uh, James was one of the, the three of the inner circle of Jesus. He was at the transfiguration. He was at Jairus' daughter when she rose again. Um, now he's dead. And the, the question is, uh, couldn't have God saved him? And not, not because God was, is weak or incompetent. It's because of other reasons. There was something going on where even Jesus said to James, in uh, Mark 10, 39, he says, the cup that I drink, you will also drink. And some bear witness through death and others through life. And um, Tertullian, who was a, a church father, he said um, in 225 AD, he said these words, we multiply whenever we are mown down by you. The blood of the Christians is the seed of the church. And uh, Jerome, in a uh, uh, hundred years later, 325, he said, The church of Christ has been founded by shedding its own blood, not that of others, by enduring outrage, not by inflicting it. Persecutions have made it grow. Martyrdoms have crowned it. And uh, so we, we see these things that we think, we, it's, it's opposite of how we would think. We would think, well, this is going to end things. And sometimes when we're facing the struggles and the persecution, we think, this is going to be the end of me. But God says, hey, this is what's going to cause the multiplication and the extension. Uh, uh, Pat, Brother Ken going to Cuba. I talked to those pastors years ago and just how they would be tortured and also um, stopped along the way going to church with a gun to their head and saying, what are you, uh, what are you doing? All the communists and the, the uh, back by the Russians at that time and they would make a stand for the Lord and that church has just gone um, exploding at the, the, the season and time that it's in right now. Uh, Herod symbolizes uh, Satan's relentless attack on the church. Herod's, Agrippa's grandfather was Herod the Great. He is the one who is responsible for the attack of trying to kill Jesus uh, in this Christmas season where we look at this and the, the death of the innocent children. Then we see uh, Herod Antipas's uh, father, who is also a Herod, and he was the one who killed John the Baptist. And now we have Herod and Tivis killing, um, killing James. The, the enemy wants to stop the church. There, there are forces that are at work in the face of the earth, both on a, a, a spiritual plane, also in uh, governmental plane, in societal plane, that wants to stop the work of the church in the earth. 
And Satan is an adversary. He opposes. He, that's what he does, especially the work of God. And any time we're involved in redemptive purposes, the enemy wants to slow things down. He wants to stop things. And you, we, we wrestle against not flesh and blood, but against what? principalities and powers and rulers of darkness of this age, which are the, the earthly forces and against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. So there's this dual thing that is going on in the natural realm and also in the spiritual realm where Satan is using them. And it's happening on a, a global scale to, to stop the spread of the gospel in different countries and different places but in a minute level as well on a personal level. You know, the, the, the devil will want to, wants to blind anybody from hearing the gospel. He wants to stop any person from experiencing uh, the truth of, of God's word. And he wants to uh, just, you, you from growing in your relationship with God. The, the devil is working overtime. He's opposing us. He doesn't want you to discover the purpose in which you were created for. He is doing his work. No, he doesn't want you to break that habit. No, he doesn't want your marriage to be healed. No, he doesn't want you to be fully devoted to your walk with God. No, he doesn't want you to be with God's people. No, he doesn't care if you're apathetic in your relationship with the Lord. He is a liar. He is a deceiver. He is a tempter. He comes to what? Steal, kill, and destroy. He is a thief. He is a murderer. And he is a destroyer. That is the mission of the enemy. That is what he's working on. We are fighting against spiritual forces that are at work in every one of our lives. And many of us and all of us will experience that erosion affecting our spirit, emotions, our mind in different areas where we are facing the forces of darkness. But that's not the end of the story. So the power of an earthly monarch is pitted against the power of the prayer to the Almighty. This is my, my second point. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer, you hear that? Constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. That This is the true power struggle. Herod's prison versus the church in prayer. It's, it's a cause and effect relationship was achieved between the prayer of the believers and Pete, Peter's release from prison. There was a constant prayer. There was this intensity of prayer. It was strenuous prayer. It was earnest prayer. This, this word here that is used for constant prayer was also used in uh, the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus, on the first time, he, he goes and prays. Then the second time he comes and prays, it says there, he prayed more earnestly. And there is an intensification of his prayers at that point where he is lifting up the, the, his, his voice to the Lord. And there are times in our, in our life we are facing the battle. We are facing the, the struggle. And it's, there's a time where there is an intensification of our prayer. We pray. There is prayer for the breakthrough. Prayer uh, is credited with the breakthrough. Uh, John Stott, the theologian, he said these words. He said, gospel is God's power to rescue people from the devil's tyranny. Then the primary way of gaining access to the power of God for waging successful spiritual warfare is prayer. And, you know, many, many times we think uh, individual prayer, and I, I just really want to encourage everybody to learn how to pray the uh, Lord's Prayer, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and etc. And how to use that as a spiritual launch pad for you personally. How do you do, do that and, and pray uh, the Lord's Prayer on a regular basis personally? But what the Bible has here is he has the church praying together. 
It ha- and we see this again and again in the New Testament scriptures where the church comes together and there is agreement in prayer that you are uniting your faith with that person next to you. You're praying with that other person. It's your petition with their petition in agreement, believing. we stacking our faith and believing for impossible things. There are things that will not happen until there is united, fervent intensification of prayer in agreement, believing God for impossible things to take place. That there is something that God just wants to do. I am so pleased with the pre-service prayer that is happening in this church. There is a revival atmosphere, folks. It coming at 10:15. There's about uh, 60 to 70 people, and before the service starts at 10:15, and there is just a, a wave of revival prayer that is going on right now. That is just actually really, really exciting to see. You know, I, in uh, our small group, uh, I teach the book of James on Wednesday night. Class is still here on Wednesday. And uh, I know this happens in all other small groups. But we were praying uh, for one individual for a health issue, just the uh, eight or nine of us who are in that class, and we're praying. And that person comes back, and he has negative tests of healing or or a touch where his body's fine. You know, uh, personally, uh, in in, uh, January, Karen and I are going to India, and there were some problems with uh, my visa going into um, India. And... We just put it out there with everybody. Hey, can we pray for this? Can we ask the Lord for there to be a a work there? Hey, the Indian government has switched their uh, viewpoint on some things now. And hey, I'm going to get a visa going into India. Prayer changes things. When we, we join together with one another with our needs, they can be small needs, they can be middle size needs, they can be big size needs. But whatever you're praying, join with somebody in prayer and believe for impossible things to take place by the power of the Lord. It is powerful to believe that. Diabolical plots and schemes of the evil one can be thwarted as the church prays. You know, maybe there's things going on in your marriage. Maybe there's some things going on in your family. Maybe you just need to say, Lord, you, could you take a hold of this thing? Could you take control of this thing? Begin to pray with other believers for the answer for impossible things. Now, let me uh, continue on in this story about the, um, in verse 6. It says, and when Herod was about to bring him out, That night, Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and guards before the door were keeping the prison. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison, and he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. Then the angel said to him, Gird yourself. Uh, how many like that? How many like that phrase? Gird yourself, okay? And tie it on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, Put on your garment and follow me. So he went out and followed him and did not know that he what was done. But by the angel, or excuse me, did not know that what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they were past the first and second guard posts, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them its own accord, and they went out and went down on one one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. Okay? First of all, uh, I want you just to notice in this passage, as it stays up there, maybe even go a little further back, Peter was sleeping, okay? The church was praying. Peter was sleeping. Okay, you know, uh, how many can ha- know those people that can sleep through anything? Okay, Peter, P- yeah, I see that hand. We'll, we'll have an, uh, you know, we get our kids in our car, we're driving for a long distance. The, you know, the five minutes into the, the van ride back, back in the day, you know, the kids are, you know, six hours later, eight hours later, they wake up and say, hey, where are we? Yeah, we're in another country is where we are, you know. <laughs> you know, we're, <laughs> we're flying, uh, you know, you're flying with somebody and you just see that person who goes to sleep for eight, ten hours on an airplane. I'd like, 
How in the world do you do that? You know, but here is Peter on his execution that night. Okay, he's going to court the next morning and he's asleep. Okay, can I tell you something? There are times when you haven't been awake and you haven't realized what's going on around you and people have been praying for you. You were in a car, you could have died in that car accident, but somebody was praying for you. You were going through that uh, stupid mistake and lack of judgment that was going on in your head at that time, but people were praying for you. And you were saved from a disaster on your life because those people were praying for you. There is something powerful to understand, you know, that we just sometimes just need to rest and relax. And sometimes the anxieties and all the things get going in our heart and we just get worried and think and realize, hey, God's got this one. I got to trust the Lord. I just got to believe him and he's going to take care of everything that it's, it's working out here. I need to just put my rest in the Lord and just trust in him. You know, it's in those seasons. You know, I, another thing about this passage is, here's, you know, it's just about comical. The, the angel comes in, you know, and the bright light shines in there, and he's still sleeping, okay, Peter. And the angel, it's like he kicks him and just say, hey, come on, let's get going, you know. And Peter, he, he was in a trance in uh, Acts 10, you know, and he, he, thought, he thought he was in a trance here. He thought he was having a vision, you know. And he, the, the angel says, arise and put on your garments, okay? And they walk through door one, door two. Then finally the gate, walking out to the street, they, they go. Sometimes the Lord will show up to you. He'll come and reveal himself to you. He'll say, this is what you need to do. You still need to get up, and you still need to walk through that door. You need to put on the garment that the Lord is telling you to put on. You know, we can put on the garment of salvation, the garment of praise. We put on the garment of, put on Christ. We put on our full identity with God. And sometimes God is telling you, hey, I need you to get up. Yes, there's a time of blessing coming on your life. There's a time of favor coming in your life. But you need to walk through that door. You need to obey and follow the Lord. No, no, I just want God to do it. God, God, just do it. No, I am doing it. But I'm asking you to get up right now from, from, your, from your stupor and from your uh, just idleness that is on your life. And I need you to get up and start walking and go through. There, there's opportunities, yes. There's oppositions, yes. But here's a door of opportunity for you that I want to bless you. I want to save you. I want to rescue. I want to pull off the bondages from your life and the habits on your life. Hey, come on. Walk. Keep walking. Keep walking in faith and believing what goodness the Lord has for your life. This is too good to be true. You know, Peter, he gets, you know, and I have to go through some verses here pretty quick. You know, it's, there's Peter. You know, he, he comes out of the doors, right? And it's just like he's walking. He's like, hey. And he says this wonderful line. I love it. You know, now Peter, uh, oh, oh, let me read this. In verse 11, he says, now I'm sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all the Jewish people what uh, we're expecting. And then it's like, hey, Peter, you're a real bright bulb, you know? You know, <laughs> you finally re- realize that God is trying to save you from their hands. And so Peter gets and he walks and he goes to the... Uh, the house, which is John Mark's house, and Mary, not Mary, mother of Jesus, but another Mary that had traveled with Jesus, but probably had a very large house where all the disciples were praying. So he goes to that house, and he's knocking on the door. <laughs> open the door. Open the door. It's me. <laughs> There's a young, lady, young girl that opens the door. It's Rhoda. And Rhoda looks, and Peter says, <laughs> and Rhoda goes, and she shuts the door. <laughs> and she goes back into the house. It's Peter. It's Peter. It's Peter. You know, 
How many just love that, that kind of look, you know? It's like, and, and then the, the people in the thing, hey, it's Peter, it's Peter at the door, it's Peter at the door. And they say, man, you are just overexcited teenage girl. You know, you, you, know, you know how sometimes 14-year-old girls get? Should I imitate this? <laughs> yeah. How many for yes? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. The 14-year-old girl, you know. <laughs> and it's like, and they say, you are just one hyper-excited young lady, okay? And they said, it's probably his angel. At least we all have at least one angel, right? But they say, oh, it's his angel, you know? The only door he had trouble passing was the door of the Christians. <laughs> he needed, he wanted to get into there with the other followers of Christ, and they're holding him back. <laughs> and God wants to, you know, open our hearts and open our spirits, but I love that one there, that God Oh, the, the joy of answered prayer. I, I love this verse here in verse 16. Now Peter continued knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Oh, the joy of answered prayer. You know that there are times in our life God so quickly answers those prayer that we can't even keep up with him. He is the one who can exceedingly abundantly do above all that we could ask or think. That is the, the Lord we serve. That sometimes it is so fast we can't even keep up with what he's doing. And the word here, astonished, is overwhelmingly amazed. You know, and God wants to put a little smile on their face. The Cuba team, they had some astonished moments. They had some amazing moments. You know, we, oh, we use that phrase so much, amazing. Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. Amazing. Well, I tell you, God wants to put some amazing into your prayers. He's just, God, hey, thank you. Thank you for what you're doing there. God wants to answer those prayers in our heart as we believe and Here's the final point, okay, is the opposer was taken out. Verse 20, now when Herod had been very angry with the people of Tyre Sidon, but they came to him with one accord, having made Blastus, the king's personal aide, their friend, they asked for peace because their country was supplied with food and by the king's country. So on a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat on his throne and gave an oration to them. And the people kept shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. Then immediately, an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God. And he was eaten by worms and died. First century historian, a guy by the name of Josephus, he wrote that, so here's some medical words for everybody that I'm going to torture in, <laughs> with these words. Okay, you ready? A parasitism caused by schizotosasoma. I were Where's the nurse? Is there a nurse in the office? Is there a doctor? <laughs> it's suggested as the etiology for chronic renal failure, en endema, halitosis, and orthopnea, and a green green of genitalia and that engendered worms. Okay, ABC News, 2000, 2,000 years later, okay? ABC News did a report on this. They did a study on, through the veterans from Puget Sound Health System. What it was, it was chronic kidney disease complica complicated by a very uncomfortable case of maggot-infested gangrene of the genitals. Okay. So he had uh, kidney failure and gonorrhea, uh, plus itching and scratching hatch maggots up the renal tube. Okay. <laughs> 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 
the, 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 cha the chapter begins. Li listen to this. Now listen to this, people. Okay, stick with me. The chapter begins with Herod killing James the Apostle of the Lord, and it ends with the angel of the Lord striking Herod. The main point of this whole chapter is this. If you oppose Jesus, you lose. That is the bottom. Who wins? We do. Who wins? We do. You come, you come with your pomp. You come with your pride. You come with your uh, vainglory. You come with the living for the praise of men. You're thinking that you're a god. You're exalted and you're the ultimate authority. Beware. Your days are numbered and you're going to be and it's going to be unpleasant. Luke puts it this way for the chapter. He's saying, make it plain to the early church. You may feel you are small. You may feel you are insignificant. You may be, feel like you are overpowered by evil forces in, in this world, in this politically, in the cultural, in the social areas. But the church of Jesus Christ will prevail. It will advance. The word of God grew and it multiplied. That is the summation of what P Peter and the book of Acts wants to tell you. The word of God grew and it multiplied. The, the, if you stay with Jesus, you win. If you oppose him, you lose. That is this scripture. So be encouraged today, friends. <laughs> Be encouraged. And as a result, be bold. Don't only be encouraged. Be bold with your, the life of Christ that you are living, that you're walking with the Lord. You know, the, the, there's the, okay, the execution, but there's the uh, <laughs> escape. There's eaten by worms. But let me add a third word, a fourth word, expansion of the gospel. God is moving. The church prayed the angels and supernatural power of heaven released. The opposer was taken out, and the word of God grew, and it multiplied. Praise the Lord. We serve an awesome God. We serve a God who's, who overcomes, Lord, the, the forces of this age. Let's all stand. All right, and let's have the musicians come at this time as well. I'm going to ask for the prayer teams to be in the four areas. It was a little difficult there with the panels over there. So maybe by where Rachel is, the fourth team over there. But if they'd be there, you know, if you have a prayer need of, about anything today, uh, the prayer teams are there to pray with you and just touch you and, and ask the Lord for miracles in your life. Everybody but just bow your heads for just a moment. I just want to ask right now if there's anyone here tonight and uh, you're not right with the Lord. You've been doing your own thing and maybe you, there was a time in your, your heart and spirit when there was a stronger fire in your, your life, the way you were serving the Lord and you sort of just got a little cold in your relationship with the Lord. There's a subtle influences that are beginning to affect you and touch you. And just uh, right now, you just say, Pastor Jeff, I'm just not right with the Lord. I'm just not walking with him the way I should be. I know that things are not like they're supposed to be. And I need to turn this around right now. Don't wait. Don't delay. The Lord is calling and he's drawing you even this day. You're not right with the Lord, and you just say, Pastor Jeff, I just need to do a course correction right now. Would you just raise your hand? Anyone here? See that hand? Anyone else? Father, I just pray right now for these people. I pray, Lord, that the fire in their heart would burn brightly, Lord. I pray the subtlety and the of the adversary that would go to work in our hearts and in our minds, causing compromise and causing just a deadness in our spirit. Lord, I pray that the fire and the, the life of God would just burn in our hearts all our days. Lord, do that. 
Lord, I pray for this church, Lord. I thank you for the mantle of prayer that rests upon it. Lord, even from the early days of Pastor Leroy and Pastor Steve, there's just been a great mantle of prayer on this place. And I pray right now, Lord, in the name of Jesus, let it continue. Let there be a fire, a fire of prayer that just burns in our hearts, Lord. Lord, when somebody's in trouble, when somebody's in, a, in chains, when somebody's in prison, Lord, in their heart and spirit, Lord, I just pray, Lord, that there would just be a breakthrough mantle, a breakthrough anointing that would rest upon this place, that there'd be a mighty anointing of the Holy Spirit, Lord, that would come upon each and every one of us, Lord. We need your grace, Lord. We need your mercy. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we win with you. We win with you. In the name of Jesus.